Hello everybody, welcome to Mathematical Statistics. My name is Jem Corcoran and I'm going to be your guide for the magical journey ahead. And I am so glad you signed up for this course because that means it runs and that means I get to teach it. And I love, love, love to teach mathematical statistics, so much so that it has caused me to move across the country twice and come out of retirement now twice. And um, so, yeah, thank you for signing up. Um, before we get into it, I just want to let you know that obviously we're on Zoom and these videos are going to be posted on YouTube, but I'd really like for you to participate. I'd like you to have your camera on whenever possible. I know not all the time. Sometimes we just don't want it on, but please try to have it on sometime and uh, comment and question. And I promise you that your face, your voice, and your name will not appear on YouTube. I'm very careful to scrub the video of all of that information. So MathStat, that's the abbreviation. What is it? The first thing that people are usually surprised to learn about is that MathStat or mathematical statistics is not statistics at all. It's probability, and it's the probability needed to do statistics, and there is a difference. So although I'm simplifying it a little bit, the basic idea is this. Probability is about the future. So suppose I have a coin and it is maybe fair or unfair, I don't know, but suppose I'm going to flip the coin 10 times, so going, that's a future word. And suppose that I want to know the probability that I will see at least six heads in those 10 flips. So we'll see future words, or maybe I want to know the expected number of heads that I will see in this very near future. That Those questions, those are questions of probability. But statistics is you're already in the future and you've seen the coin flips, the 10 flips, and you've seen heads, 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 tails, tails, heads, tails, heads, tails, tails. And you are trying to figure out things about the coin. So you're basically trying to reverse engineer the probability there to figure out things like, is the coin a fair coin or is it biased towards heads or tails? Were the flips independent or was someone flipping it with a spatula and you just kept getting the opposite thing, heads, tails, heads, tails. So statistics is like reverse engineering probability. And so in order to do statistics, you need to know probability. And again, mathematical statistics specifically is the probability needed in order to do statistics. So that's what this course is about. And it's a very theoretical course. There's going to be a lot of proofs and theorems and no data at all. So I hope you're not too disappointed. Um, get out while you still can. But for those of you staying, I think you're really going to love this. So a couple of technical details. We have a Canvas page. Let me share this with you. Okay, so the Canvas page is going to look something like this. Um, and so at the top, we're going to have announcements. And this is just how I'm going to communicate with you uh, with things that I need to tell you, like the homework's been posted or there's a typo here. So right now, there's just a welcome announcement. And I'll let you read that at your leisure. Um, and then we have, this is a theta in a coffee cup. And this is one of my skink's tails. So a skink is a type of lizard. And I have a lot of those. And hopefully, some of those will visit during the course. Um, here are things that are mostly on every Canvas page at CU. Um, these are these are things that you know you need to know about drop dates and all sorts of technical things that go on any course. But specific to this course, here I have a button. It's called Course Notes, and it takes you to uh, the PDF of my textbook, which is available on Amazon. But I don't. If you're in my live course, you should never be buying anything from me. That's just weird. So you will have a copy of the PDF version of that textbook. And over here is a table of distributions. I'll click on that later. That's going to be super important uh, for us in this course, and we're going to use that every day. Over here is a link for homework and solutions. So you can see that problem set one has already been posted. I'll, I'll tell you about the due dates in a moment, and solutions will eventually be there. So let me go back. Okay, so here are some Zoom links. This is our live lecture Zoom. This 
These are my three office hours during the week. I'll let you in on a little secret. These are all the exact same link. So if you want to just bookmark one link, you'll be good for the entire semester. But maybe the most important thing to see on here is this button called modules. So let's click on that. Okay, so the modules page is going to look something like this. It's not going to be filled out like this one is. It's going to be filled out kind of as we go. So right now you should be seeing this module one. Um, this is the date. It's January 17th. And when you click on this link for reading and videos, what you're going to see is just, um, just a couple of sentences about what we're going to talk about that day, a list of the objectives, which is also what we're going to talk about that day, things you should read if you care to read along in the course notes or my textbook and um, a video which is going to be posted shortly after the course so this is an old canvas page i wanted it to have stuff on it for you to see so this is an old video um, but today's video is going to be posted on your canvas page this evening and then at the bottom there's a section called assignments and there is a problem set that you can click on, and these will be your homework problems for the week. So our homeworks are going to go from Wednesdays to Wednesdays. So an assignment's gonna come out each Wednesday and be due the next Wednesday by 11.59 p.m. And we're gonna use Gradescope, which I think most of you have used by now but I will do a quick tutorial on Gradescope later for anyone that needs that, but it's just a way to submit your homework and for me to grade it kind of easily. And yeah, so um, I think we're ready to go. Did I already say that? I guess we're ready to go. Um, so we're gonna start with some prereq re review. And for those of you that have the right background, this is gonna, seem maybe insulting, but I assure you we're going to ramp up pretty quickly. So today's lecture may be boring and half of the next lecture, but then it's going to take off. And um, this is a graduate course. I know some of you are upper division undergrad students, but this is a course that will prepare you for our prelim exams in applied math. And throughout the course, I will be taking some problems off of old prelims and and assigning them and going through them with you and you know we'll figure out how to solve all that stuff. Um, so prereqs. Um, there is a chapter zero in my book and that is the stuff before chapter one. So that's not really stuff I would consider math stat, but the things you need to know for math stat. I think there's 10 or 11 sections in chapter zero and Ideally, you would already know sections one through seven or maybe one through eight, but you might want to take a quick glance to make sure or just to um, familiarize yourself with notation that I'll be using in here. I'm going to talk about some of that stuff in that sections today and in our next class. And uh, it's going to be really spotty and kind of in pieces and maybe confusing because I'm trying to recap sort of all of your previous probability in a class and a half. So the homework is not going to maybe, I'm not going to cover every topic in the homework, and I never do that outside of the first homework. So part of the point of the first homework assignment is to force you to sort of self-review. But once we get to the next homework and the next, you know, they will all be things we definitely talked about in class. And if I don't make it, I will, I will take those things off the homework. Okay, so a little probability review. Let me share my screen here. And of course, I have to install a plugin. I have to install a new plugin every single time I do this. Oh, I just, sometimes I share this to my neighbor's Roku. <laughs> I don't know what they think if this is popping up on their TV. Um, I don't know. Maybe they're happy to learn math stat. So mathematical statistics and our review, we're going to start off by talking about simple random variables. Actually, let me go back a little more to a um, more of an overview kind of thing. So I think that most of you have heard about the normal distribution. If not, you're going to learn it in here. But 
it has a probability density function. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, that will be in the review today. But it is the bell curve. And so this is supposed to be a normal distribution PDF or probability density function. Again, I'm using some acronyms that I haven't defined yet, but we haven't really started the course yet. But this is a curve under which area represents probability. And the normal distribution has a mean parameter, which is the number that this bell curve is centered at. And it's usually denoted by a Greek letter mu. And then it has a variance parameter, which we will eventually talk about, which is denoted by a sigma squared. And that's a parameter that controls how spread out this distribution is. Is it kind of a squish down bell or you know, a really steep kind of thing? I'm sorry about my awful handwriting and drawing, but I do feel strongly that that I should do mathematics live. I, I hate slides. I want you to, to learn that mathematics is not things to memorize and bullet points, but stuff that, you know, comes from the gut. So I do think it's important that I write this out. And I know my handwriting is not the best, so I apologize in advance for that. And stop me at any time if there's something I can clarify in terms of my handwriting or anything else. Okay, so suppose we have a normal distribution somewhere, and maybe this represents the length of fish in a salmon hatchery. I recently visited a salmon hatchery um, in the Pacific Northwest. And so according to this bell curve, we have a number line here. I don't have any numbers, so you don't have a sense of scale. But area under this curve represents probability. So there's a lot of area in here, which is saying that a lot of the fish are between this length and this length, whatever those numbers are, and less are out here or out here. And we can break this up in all sorts of ways. But there is this mean mu, and we're going to assume this is unknown to us. So we're going to take a sample of fish and we're going to measure their length. And I'm going to call those measurements capital X1, capital X2, out through capital XN. So we're going to grab N fish and measure them with, I don't know, we're going to agree on a unit of measurement like inches, but it's going to be infinite accuracy. So we can have a fish that is 14.27113523. High inches because I'm trying to describe something that is truly a continuous random variable. And so this is going to be a sample sort of before it's been taken. So if you actually go take those measurements, you're going to get numbers. I don't know. Just making stuff up, obviously. Um, but before we take the sample, we're sort of preparing ourselves to get these numbers. And we don't know what they're going to be. And they're going to be different depending on which fish I chose. And I'm trying to randomly select them. So we're going to have a bunch of random variables that are sort of these numbers before they've been observed. So let me get rid of those. Oops, sorry about that. And most of this course, we're going to want to figure out the value of um, unknown parameters like this or this in this case. And we're going to want to figure that out from our sample. So let's uh, let's focus on the unknown mean mu. This is like an average, and we're going to define this. And we have a sample here that we could actually average. And so how is that related to the unknown mean mu? So we would call the average for this sample the sample mean. And it's usually denoted by a capital X bar. And it's going to be 1 over n times the sum as i goes from 1 to n of the xi's. We're going to add them all up and divide by n. And this is going to be an estimator for the unknown mu. And we usually denote estimators with hats. So if we want to estimate mu, I'm going to write mu hat. And an estimator of mu, which we'll call mu hat, might be this sample mean, the actual average from the sampled lengths of the fish. So that seems like 
a good idea. You know, there's a true average out there. If you had every possible fish and they were following this distribution, their lengths were following this distribution, but we only have a sample. So this is kind of a good idea, maybe what I would call a common sense estimator for estimating the unknown mean, just to look at the mean in the sample. But is it the best we can do? Can we do better? Can we do worse? I, I know we can do worse. We could just jump up and down and say that mu hat is 14. Sorry, I used the wrong pen there. So that's a little fuzzy. Sorry about that. Um, that's an estimator. If you just insist that the mean length of the fish is 14 inches, you know, you, you're estimating something, but you're not doing a good job, I, I would assume. So we want to know how to estimate an unknown parameter, like what kind of, this is called a statistic. Any function of the data is called a statistic. And we want to figure out what statistic we should use to estimate an unknown parameter like mu or sigma squared and what it means to have a good estimator to have a better estimator and to have the best estimator. And that's gonna be, that's actually my favorite part of this course. When we get to talk about the best estimator where no one can do any better, but that doesn't make sense if you don't have properties, you know, what do you even mean by best? So a lot of the beginning of the course is gonna be us talking about things that will lead us to being able to define properties of estimators of unknown parameters. So if that didn't make sense, it's because you don't have the prereqs, which we're going to start now, and uh, don't be scared off by that. Let's talk about random variables. Is everybody okay? Just let me know. Speak up at any time, live. Um, you could put something in the chat. Sometimes I miss it because I'm just too into the math stats, so someone else speak up and say there's something in the chat. Um, but yeah, I want to hear from you. So yeah, let's start a review. I'm going to talk about random variables. Now these in statistics are always denoted by capital letters like um, capital X, capital Y, and capital Z. Those are the common ones. Um, and I know you might not be able to tell whether or not those are capital right now, but my lowercase letters are much curlier and written next to the capital ones will look much smaller. So um, I think in the context, you should be able to know whether I have capital letters or lowercase letters, but do not hesitate to ask. Okay, so um, a random variable is a mapping or a function from the outcomes, the set of outcomes from an experiment involving randomness to the real numbers. So I think that's important to note, and I'm gonna start right in with an abbreviation. So a, an RV, a random variable is a mapping, which is just a function from the set of all possible outcomes of an experiment involving probability or randomness into the real numbers. Oops, got us. Sorry about that. Okay, Ugh, I'm so sorry about my handwriting. Okay, so let's. Sorry about that. So let's look at an example. I might have a coin and it might be fair or unfair. Let's say um, I've got a coin and it has, it's not necessarily fair. So it's not necessarily 50, 50. Um, and so it has, um, boy, that's annoying. But it has two outcomes, heads and tails which I'm just gonna abbreviate with an H and a T. And let's suppose that the probability of getting heads on the coin is some unknown number, little p, where p is something between zero and one. I mean, it could be zero if I have a, a coin with two tails, or it could be one if I have a coin with two heads, you know, one on each side, but otherwise it's something in between and hopefully it's one half. I am going to define a random variable from this experiment involving probability and randomness. 
I'm going to let this capital X be the value one if we get heads on that coin and zero if we get tails on that coin. So there's the mapping, you know, I'm really plugging in like an outcome like X of heads. You know, it doesn't have to be from numbers. It's from outcomes of an experiment and it's giving us numbers. So that is an example of a discrete random variable. And depending on what P is, you're going to see maybe uh, if you repeat this experiment and try to figure out the probability or the by looking at the proportion of time you get heads, maybe you'll see zeros and ones for your random variable and you might see kind of a lot of ones. I'm going to make sort of a histogram and less zeros. And as you move the unknown parameter P around, the bars on this histogram are going to move around and they're representing the distribution for the two values, zero and one. We say that this random variable, because it's so special, it gets a name. We say that it has a Bernoulli distribution with unknown or maybe known parameter P. So we say that X has a Bernoulli distribution with parameter that helps us describe exactly how this is working, um, P. And we write, to say that you know more compactly, we write X squiggly line, so that squiggly line can be read as has the distribution. And then the word Bernoulli, or sometimes just burn, and then open parentheses, P, close parentheses. So this is how I describe this setup quickly. This is the name of a distribution. So this is, again, a discrete random variable. It takes on values from a discrete set. Um, and this a, a distribution or a random variable has an associated function known as a probability mass function or a probability density function. So a probability mass function, which is actually not what I'm writing right here, is a name of something that is reserved for discrete random variables, whereas a probability density function is something that's reserved for discrete, uh, sorry, continuous random variables usually. And I actually use the same the same terminology for both. So there's a probability mass function and a probability density function. And again, the probability mass function goes with discrete random variables, whereas the probability density function is supposed to go with continuous random variables. Um, but I use the, I call them both a PDF or probability density function, but know that it means something very different when you're talking about discrete versus continuous random variables. So this is usually going to be denoted by a letter F is very function looking. Oops, I switched to that weird chalk again. A letter F, um, it's gonna have an argument, could be anything you want, I'm gonna put a little X in here. And this is defined to be, so when you see that colon in front of an equal sign, that means is defined as the probability that X equals little x. So, Let's continue for the Bernoulli distribution. This is going to be an example of a PDF or probability density function or probability math function, if you want to say that. So I'm going to suppose that X has the Bernoulli distribution with parameter P. I want to write down uh, or find the PDF or PMF for x, and I will stop by the third lecture saying both of those. I'm just going to say PDF. So uh, we already know what this is, but we're just writing this down in a slightly more formal way. I'm going to call it f of x. This is the probability that x equals x, and that little x is something we get to plug in. Now, our random variable x takes on the values 0 and 1. And so this is going to be sort of a piecewise definition in this case. 
this probability is going to be, it's going to take on the value one with probability P. Uh, so I don't want to put a one here. I want to put the probability here because that's what I'm trying to write down. This is going to be P. Oh, I keep grabbing this wrong thing here. Sorry. P, if this little X we're plugging in is one, it's going to be one minus P. If this little X we're plugging in is zero, and then the random variable doesn't take on any other value. So the probability that X is five or 1.2, that's always going to be zero. So I'll get a third piece here. It's going to be zero otherwise. So this is our first example of a probability density function or probability mass function because it's discrete. Um, make sense? Okay, so we're always going to use, or most of the time when we can, an F. Most people do. But we're often going to be talking about multiple random variables at the same time, like maybe a random variable X and a random variable Y. And so if we want to write down two PDFs, we usually call them both F, but put a subscript on them. I want to leave this blank for just a second. These are different functions and they get arguments and the arguments tend to match the, um, the letter that's used for the random variable. But it is important to note that you can talk about the PDF for X evaluated at some Y. This is gonna be the probability that X equals some Y. So if we have two random variables, we're gonna use F for both of them, but we're gonna add on a subscript and I just wanted to point out that sometimes, maybe don't write this down because um, I don't want to do this in this course, but in like research articles, research level probability, you're often going to see an F of X and an F of Y, and they're going to represent two different PDFs. So they use the argument to tell you what PDF they're talking about. Um, but when you're learning, this is a bad idea because literally when I write this, these are the same functions, but you're going to have two random variables with potentially different PDFs. So sometimes in, in again, like journal articles, people will use the argument to tell you what random variable it goes with. Um, and that is really bad notation to start with, at least until you're really solid on this stuff. So I'm not going to do that multiple random variables, and I'm going to start using subscripts. Okay, so that was an example of a discrete random variable and a discrete distribution, the Bernoulli distribution. So now I want to talk about continuous random variables or continuous distributions. So this is going to be something like the length of those fish. Um, you have a salmon hatchery and you're going to go in and randomly select some. And there is some underlying true distribution about the heights of the fish. Maybe it has that normal distribution, maybe something else. So as an example, maybe, I don't know, maybe um, like just for scale, maybe this is 0, 5, 10, I'm obviously totally making this up, but maybe the distribution of fish looks kind of like that. That's actually not supposed to be a bell curve and it's not extending to the negatives in this case, although in general it can. So this is going to represent a probability density function or a PDF. And for a continuous random variable or distribution, this is a curve under which area represents probability. Why is it defined differently? Um, when you're talking about a continuous random variable, I want to assume that we can measure these fish with infinite accuracy. Because let's say I'm measuring in inches, and if I can only measure up to a tenth of an inch, then I could get values like 13 inches, 13.1 inches, 12.9 inches. It's still, it's going to be discrete. But if this is supposed to be continuous, I need to imagine I have infinite accuracy. Uh, and if I do, and I ask you to guess maybe 
if you know anything about salmon, what is the probability that a randomly selected salmon is between 12 inches and 17 inches? Well, I don't know. There's some probability of that. And if you know salmon, you might have an idea about what that is. But if I then say, what is the probability that a randomly selected salmon is between 12 inches and 15 inches? So that's a smaller interval. And it should be a smaller probability. It's, it's actually contained. So I went from 12 to 17. There's some probability of being in there. And now 12 to 15, um, that interval is contained in the first one. And it's less likely to be in that smaller interval. So you get a smaller probability. 12 to 13 inches, it's less likely. It's harder to fall in that interval. 12 to 12.5, harder. And what if I ask you the probability that a randomly selected fish is between 12 inches and 12.1 inches? So that is getting really hard. And in fact, these probabilities are getting vanishingly small. Uh, for any continuous random variable, you always have the probability that x equals some x is zero, always. Um, and this is why we don't define the PDF, I would call it f of x, and we defined it to be the probability that x equals x, but we're not gonna do that in the continuous case because that's a totally uninteresting function. It's always zero. Instead, the PDF or probability density function is going to be a curve under which area represents probability. So if I want the probability that the length of the fish is say between five inches and 10 inches, I want the area under the curve from here to here, which we can get by integrating the PDF. And so this is gonna be the integral from five to 10 of whatever the PDF is, dx. And just, you know, I these inequalities could be strict. One of them could be strict. They could both be strict. Neither, because the area under the curve of like a single line is always going to be zero. So this integral is going to be the answer uh, for this sort of thing, whether or not the inequalities are strict or one of them is strict or the other one or neither or whatever. Is everybody okay? I know, I know, it's really basic. Uh, if you have the right prereqs, you've got to be bored out of your mind, but um, please come back. Okay, what else do we need to talk about? Um, oh, let's do an example. So we had a Bernoulli distribution as our first example for a discrete random variable. And here I'm going to start by just giving you the PDF. So I'm not going to start by describing an underlying experiment. I'm going to go back to that. So suppose that x is a continuous random variable with PDF or probability density function f of x equals, and this is not the salmon example is just moving on from that, like 3.2e to the negative 3.2x if x is greater than or equal to zero and zero otherwise. Let me sketch this for you. So when you plug in x equals zero, you get e to the zero, which is one, and you're just left with that leading coefficient of 3.2. So this is gonna start at 3.2, and then as x increases, it's gonna go down like this exponentially. This is in fact the PDF for an exponential distribution. So we say that x has an exponential distribution with, and I definitely have something more to say about what I'm about to say, with rate 3.2. I'll come back and define the rate, but it is the parameter for this PDF. So in general, people use a lambda to denote this rate, or maybe they don't. <laughs> so please bear with me for a moment. Um, we would write x squiggly line has the distribution exp for exponential, and a lot of people would write a lambda in there. And this means 
that x has the probability density function that looks like this. f of x equals lambda e to the minus lambda x for x greater than or equal to 0 and 0 when x is less than 0. And so that looks like this. It starts at lambda and goes down exponentially. So most people write this. Squiggly line has this exponential distribution. The problem with this notation is when some people write this, they actually mean that the PDF is this um, and not what I wrote. And I would say it's, I don't know, it's close to maybe 60% of people write this and maybe 40% of people write this. It depends on your background. If you come from like a Markov chains background and stochastic processes, you probably use this one. If you're coming from probability, you probably use this one. But there is an average value for this distribution, kind of like a, a balancing point. Um, if you imagine this as a plane and a kind of a center of mass that you learned about in calculus. And um, means it looks weird. Um, so let me let me talk about an, another example. Suppose people are coming in to your store, you own some store, at a rate of five customers per minute. And suppose you assume that the length of time between those customer arrivals follows this distribution, um, looking like this with lambda equals five, a rate of five customers per minute. So if X is the time between arrivals to your store, so another way to say this would be inter-arrival times, and if you say they're coming in at a rate of five per minute, then what is the average amount of time you have to wait? What is the average value for X? That is going to turn out to be, we need to define or review expectations. Um, if they're coming in at a rate of five per minute, then the average amount of time between arrivals is one fifth of a minute. So you can describe this distribution in terms of the rate parameter of five per minute or the inter-arrival time average of one fifth of a minute. That is the difference between using this PDF and this PDF. And so when people write this, they mean one of those two things, and it could be hard to tell what they mean. So for this class, I'm going to expand this notation. I'm actually mostly going to use the rate, but I'm going to write x has the distribution exponential, and I'm going to put the word rate equals lambda in here, and that means x has the PDF, I guess I don't really need to write this again, but I'm committed now. Lambda e to the minus lambda x for x greater than or equal to zero, and it's zero otherwise. The lambda is a parameter for this model, much like the p for the Bernoulli distribution. And then if I write, and I'm going to do this kind of rarely, but if I write x squiggly line has the distribution mean lambda that means that we're talking about the PDF that is 1 over lambda e to the minus x over lambda for x greater than or equal to 0 and 0 otherwise. So I'm going to write this rate equals or mean equals, but just know that most people write it like this. And so you're not sure which one they're talking about. If you're reading a textbook or a paper or a website, you're going to have to back up and, and try to figure out from the context or where they defined it, which exponential distribution they are talking about. But here I'm going to use two notations, so there's no question. Okay, so I said I, I was um, that random variables are mappings from outcomes of experiments involving probability into real numbers, and um, sometimes the experiments are numbers already. Like if you're going to roll a six-sided die, and maybe let's make it unfair, it's weighted just to make it a little more interesting. Uh, if you record the outcome, you are recording a number. You're not translating something to a number. So often random variables being outcomes, mappings, are actually the outcomes from the experiment if those are numeric. And the exponential distribution comes up a lot in the kind of example I gave you. If you have a store and people are coming in, uh, it's a good distribution for modeling inter-arrival times.
And the assumptions for getting a PDF like the exponential would be that you have a constant arrival rate. So nothing's changing. You don't have like a, a rush time in your store. And that the number of arrivals in non-overlapping intervals of time are completely independent. Um, and yeah, so that is almost it. There's a, there's a, just a little more there. But with these basic assumptions, if you were taking a course in Markov processes, you would be able to prove or derive this PDF. It's going to come out of relatively simplistic assumptions. So if you stick around and take Markov with me next semester, uh, we're going to derive that from scratch. But here, I'm just going to state that the exponential distribution is a PDF. We know the form of the PDF. It's a curve under which area represents probability. Everybody okay? Okay, so that might have been old stuff to you. And this next thing, maybe not so much. I think this is going to be new for more of you. And that is, um, we're going to talk about indicator notation. I love this. And by two weeks into this course, I think you're going to love it too. It's going to be really, really useful for what we're doing in here. So first, let me define an indicator. So forget random variables and distributions. I'm going to let A be a set. Just for concreteness, think about it as a subset of the real numbers. And I'm going to define an indicator function. I'm going to call it capital I. Now, there's other notations I'll talk about in a moment. Sub A. And it's going to be a function of some argument like x. And it's going to take on two values. So it's going to be 1 if x is in A and 0 if x is not in A. So it's going to indicate to you where x fell. Did it fall in A or did it not fall in A? And other common notations for this, like a double kind of bold 1. Uh, some people use a chi. Some people use something known as an Iverson bracket, which is just a couple of square brackets, but in context, it should make sense. And that's usually more like physics applications. I am going to stick with this capital I. Actually, I prefer this notation when I'm writing a paper. Um, I think it looks a lot nicer, but this is easier to write on a chalkboard and write quickly. And it's also the notation I used in my notes. OK, so that's the definition of an indicator function. And now I want to take the two PDFs we know about, the Bernoulli and the exponential distribution, and write them using indicator functions for reasons. So give me a moment on that. Um, so as an example, suppose that x has the Bernoulli distribution with parameter p. We know that the PDF, it takes on probability p, 1 minus p, or 0, depending on whether x is 1, x is 0, or otherwise. And I want to write this down all in one line with an indicator function. So we can write this as a p to the x and a 1 minus p to the 1 minus x. So let me just start there. I'm not finished. But look at this function. If you plug in x equals 1, you get p to the 1, which is p. And then you get 1 minus 1. So you get an exponent of 0, which makes that second part of the PDF disappear. So you can see that if you plug in x equals 1 here, you do, in fact, get p. And if you plug in x equals 0, this part is going to disappear. This is going to turn into an exponent of 1. And you do get 1 minus p. Now, I want this to also be 0 when I plug in any other x. So I'm going to put an indicator here. And I'm going to put a set, the set of values that x can take on as a subscript. Now, this is a discrete random variable. So I'm going to use brackets, a set notation, and say that x has to be in the set containing 0 and 1. So now, when I plug in a 0 or 1 here, this is going to be 1 if, in fact, I did plug in one of these numbers. And if I plug in anything else, this indicator is going to be 0 and knock the whole thing out. So the entire thing is going to be 0. 
So this is uh, using indicators is a kind of slick way to denote a PDF. And I have an actual reason for doing this because number one, it's it's not that hard to write N0 otherwise. And number two, I am sure we could just agree that if I write this down, it means automatically zero otherwise. But I chose to bring this indicator in and I have a reason for doing this. And I'm afraid to um, explain it right now because I'll go off on a tangent, but there's gonna be proofs uh, or statements that we're gonna prove that um, if you include indicators in the PDF, you can say things way more compactly. Like it's, I, it's coming. Uh, indicators, you're gonna love them. Let's just start getting used to them for now. Um, but yeah, so does anyone have any questions? Okay, let's do the exponential with an indicator. Gosh, it keeps going to this weird fuzzy chalk thing. So I have X with an exponential distribution with rate lambda. And the PDF, I won't rewrite that. We saw that pretty recently. But with indicators, it is lambda e to the minus lambda x. And then an indicator that says that the values we can have here are the interval. So no brackets anymore, but parentheses or, or square brackets, no curly brackets, to infinity of x. So when you plug in a number between zero and infinity, this is one, and then you get whatever you get when you plug in that number to the exponential PDF. But if you try to plug in a negative number, this with a negative number in it doesn't make sense um, in terms of the probability of seeing like an inter-arrival time be negative. But fortunately, if you plug in a negative number here, that indicator is gonna turn to zero and knock the whole thing out. And because single points are unimportant for continuous random variables, you're often gonna see this as, so let me just write the same thing out. And the change here is gonna be an open um, interval, open zero to infinity. It's usually gonna be written like that. So these are exactly the same thing. Um, in terms of, you know what? Okay. <laughs> You know what, this is not actually exactly the same, right? Because this one, if you plug in x equals zero, you'll get lambda. And here, if you plug in x equals zero, you'll get zero because this will turn to zero because this, the, the zero endpoint is not included in there. Um, so these are not equal, but as a PDF, they represent the same probabilities. So what I'm trying to say is if someone says you have an exponential distribution with rate lambda, they will often, myself included, write this PDF and not include that endpoint. So sorry about that, that was a little confusing. Hopefully that makes sense. And this brings us to the table of distributions. So let's go back to the Canvas page for a moment. So the home page uh, down here is a button. It says distributions. And if you click on it, you're going to get a two-sided table of distributions. Well, I guess this is a download. And it's taking a moment. Okay, so there's two pages. There's a side with discrete distributions and there's a side with continuous distributions. And the first column is filled with the names of the distributions. So here you see the Bernoulli that we, are, we already talked about. And here, it's maybe hard to see on, on in this meeting because it's small, but okay, I can't highlight that. Here you see the Bernoulli probability mass function or probability density function using the indicator notation. And the next column tells you where the parameter lives. So for the Bernoulli distribution, the parameter P is between zero and one. And the other columns we'll talk about eventually. And on the other page, we have continuous distribution. So, so far, we kind of briefly talked about the normal distribution, but not really. But we just talked about the exponential distribution with rate lambda. And here is the probability density function for that. And I did forget to say that lambda has to be positive. If you put a negative rate in here, then your exponent is negative lambda x. And if you plug in positive x's, but lambda was negative, you have e to positive values, and that's just gonna blow up. 
um, a PDF, a probability density function, needs two properties. It needs to be non-negative. It's representing probability, right? And negative probabilities, even though I tried really hard to make sense out of that, I thought it would be cool. It's not a thing. <laughs> and so it needs to be non-negative and it needs to integrate to one. So you can't have functions that just blow up like that uh, and that would integrate to infinity. So yeah, so the, the rate parameter for the exponential does need to be positive. So just like I wrote P is between zero and one, I should have written lambda is greater than zero for the exponential distribution. But we're gonna talk about all these other distributions and what the remaining columns mean eventually. Actually, we're gonna, we're gonna fill that up pretty quickly in the first couple of weeks. But you can see I've used indicator notation in there. And again, uh, I do have a reason for this that maybe is not so clear. So let's get used to indicator notation now. Okay, so with that, I wanna talk about, oh, I need to share my screen again. Please tell me if I start talking and writing and you're not seeing it because I never shared it. <laughs> if I had classes where people were shy about that, and I understand that, but you know, I've been going on and on writing for 15 minutes and then someone says, are we supposed to be seeing that? <laughs> um, yeah, so please speak up if you see something like that happening. But uh, next up in our review is the idea of a cumulative distribution function. So this is something that goes with any random variable or a distribution. And the notation is always gonna be a capital F of some X. And if you have a random variable, say X, this is the probability that X is less than or equal to X. So we're accumulating probability up to a value X. And this definition holds whether or not you have a discrete or continuous random variable. In the discrete case, this probability is gonna be computed using sums, and in the continuous case, it's gonna be computed using integrals, but um, the CDF is defined the same either way. And just like we talked about earlier with the PDFs, if we're talking about two random variables and two CDFs, we're gonna use a capital F for both of them, but we're gonna put subscripts on the CDF so that technically we could we could actually plug a Y into the X CDF and vice versa. Okay, so let's compute this. We'll just do our two examples that we have already. So suppose that X has the Bernoulli distribution with parameter P. We know the PDF is the probability that X equals X because it's discrete and it takes on a couple of values. We can write it with indicators now. I'm gonna just write it one more time. Oops. We're gonna get probability P if X is one. We're gonna get one minus P if X is zero and we're gonna get zero otherwise. It's gonna write else because it's faster. So what is the probability that X is say less than or equal to one? It's always less than or equal to one because it only takes on the value zero or one. And the same thing is true if I put in like a less than or equal to 3.2, it's always zero or one, it's always less than or equal to 3.2. So the sort of cumulative probability is one. Let me, let me try to show this cumulative probability here. I'm gonna try to graph the CDF, the capital F. Now our random variable X takes on two values, zero and one. And so back here, like if I plug in, I don't know, negative one half, the probability, come on, that X is less than or equal to negative one half, it's not happening. This random variable takes on the value zero or one, so this probability is always zero. And in fact, the CDF is gonna be down at zero here. And it's not until we hit zero that we're gonna accumulate some probability. The probability that X is less than or equal to zero, in this case, for the Bernoulli distribution, it's gonna depend on you know, what values it can take on. This is just the probability that it's equal to zero. And that is one minus P. So I am gonna be flat here at zero and then, oops. And then I'm gonna jump up to one minus P. And then the probability that X is less than or equal to say 0 
The only value x takes on, the values are 0 and 1. So this is just the probability that x equals 0, and that is 1 minus p. So what I'm trying to say is for all the x values in here, we we'll always have the value 1 minus p. But once you hit the next number the distribution can take on, you jump up. And in this case, you jump up by a height of p. That's the additional probability you pick up when you hit 1. And you're now up to a height of 1. And so the CDF, the cumulative distribution function for a discrete random variable is going to look like a step function. And you're going to have a step up and the the sort of heights of the steps, they're not supposed to look equal. Um, they could be, I guess, if p is one half, but they should maybe look different. The heights are going to denote probabilities for you or are going to represent probabilities. So there is our first CDF. And if you want to write this out, like I've just drawn it, we can say piecewise that it's zero if x is less than zero. It's one minus p if x is equal to zero but less than one. It's going to be one if x is greater than or equal to one. And there is no zero otherwise here because we've actually taken care of the whole world. Anything less than zero, anything between zero and one, including zero, and anything greater than or equal to one. So we've got it all. Um, so there's the CDF written down. And I could write this. <laughs> now I've pushed, I'm pushing these indicators on you, but I'm actually not going to use them for CDFs because they're really going to simplify things for us when we use them for PDFs. But for CDFs, I think they make things look a little bit worse. So what do I mean by that? If I were to try to write this out on one line, um, well, all CDFs. So let me write that first. If you look at the limit as x goes down to negative infinity of a CDF, that's representing you know, the probability that x is less than or equal to negative infinity. And that will never happen. Um, so this it is always 0. And if you look at the limit as x goes to positive infinity of a CDF, that's going to represent the probability that x is less than or equal to infinity. And that will always happen with probability 1. So all CDFs need to go off to 1. The limit is 1 as x goes to infinity. And if you look at the limit as x goes to negative infinity, it's 0. So in our picture here, we can see that no matter how far left you go, it's 0. And no matter how far to the right you go, it's 1. And so that's a property that all CDFs have to have. And the point is that there isn't... So why do I not want to use indicators with CDFs? Because they're not n0 otherwise. Um, so... We have a certain region that we kind of care about, where the values for the distribution are. And then it's 0 over here, but it's not 0 over here. And so writing this CDF with indicators, we could certainly do it. We would get 1 minus p times an indicator that x is between 0 and 1. And we'd include 0 with a, with a bracket and not include 1 with open parentheses. plus uh, we get one, not that you have to write that, times the indicator that um, x is from one, including one, so that is a square bracket, to infinity. And so if you plug in like a negative x, it's not in either of these intervals. So both indicators are going to turn off and be zero. So you will get zero for the whole thing. Um, so yeah, we can write CDS with indicators, but it kind of kind of makes them look worse rather than more simple. You could certainly write them. Uh, I'll know what you mean. And if you do that on your homework or exams, um, that's great. But I tend to not use indicators with CDFs. Because again, the reason I'm using them with PDFs is we have some theorems coming up that say things like, if this PDF factors into this and that, uh, having indicators in there are, are going to be, it's going to be especially helpful in the PDF environment, but not so much the CDF. Okay, so there's a CDF for a discrete random variable. Uh, I have... Uh, 
a few more minutes left. So let's look at, I'm still in my CDF, cumulative distribution function section, but let's look at a continuous random variable. Our only one we know about right now is the exponential with rate lambda. The PDF is f of x equals lambda e to the minus lambda x, and an indicator that says that x is taking on values from zero to infinity. And again, you could choose to include zero or not, but it looks like this, it starts at lambda and then goes down exponentially, and it's zero otherwise. So there'd be like a hole there. So the CDF is the probability that x is less than or equal to x. And so I'm just going to put a little x on this graph. Now the probability that this random variable is less than or equal to x is this area. So we can get this by integrating. This is going to be the integral from, we could say, you know what, I'm going to say minus infinity to x. I could have said zero to infinity because there's no area over here, but let's see how this would be taken care of automatically. So this is the integral of the PDF, and let me use a different letter. You can use the same letter, but I think it's weird to use an x and then plug in an x. And I'm going to actually do this with the, in with the indicator. So this is lambda e to the minus lambda u, an indicator that says that u is between zero and infinity. And so this is, oops, this is gonna make the whole PDF zero out when the u's are negative. So no, you do not need to write this out each time, but I just wanted to show you that you can always start from minus infinity and be okay, even if the distribution only takes on positive values, for example. This is going to break up into two integrals, uh, minus infinity to zero, over which the whole PDF is going to be zero, plus zero to x of the rest of it. And if you do that integral, I'll just leave that to you. You're going to get one minus e to the minus lambda u, and then you're going to plug in x and zero. You're going to end up with one minus e to the minus lambda x. And so, of course, you could start with a zero right there if you see what's coming, but it doesn't hurt to always sort of throw in all values and let the actual PDF decide how to cut off the limits of integration for you. So the CDF here, I could write with indicators, but I just said I don't like to do that with CDFs, is one minus e to the minus lambda x for x greater than or equal to zero, and it's gonna be zero for x less than zero. It, are we okay at equal zero? If I plug in zero here, I get e to the zero, which is one, I get one minus one, and that is zero. And in fact, you know, the probability that x is less than or equal to zero for the exponential distribution, uh, it only takes on values, positive values. And you might say this is the probability that x equals zero, but that's zero for a continuous random variable. So by putting the equal sign here, I do actually get the right thing. I do get zero. And for some theoretical reasons that we would talk you would talk you would learn about if you took a course in measure theory, CDFs need to be right continuous functions. It it just, you know, without the measure theory, um, let's go back to the the step function for the Bernoulli. It's representing like I have no probability, no probability, no probability, and suddenly at this value, I jump up. And so you can see that you accumulate, if this is a height p, probability p, when you plug in the value zero. This is a right continuous function because um, I've got this endpoint filled in and this one empty. Um, so it's filled in from the right, and it's just what would it even mean to fill it in from the left? So make this solid. So this would say you jump up immediately after zero, but not at zero. And that's kind of weird. Certainly for a discrete random variable, that's weird. But there are theoretical reasons that CDFs need to be right continuous. And I'm not gonna hold you to that. So if you don't have, if you have this on the other side for this course, it'll be okay, but you really shouldn't. Okay, so I think uh, we are out of time. So in the next uh, class, we're going to talk about
expectation, expected value, or means, which are probability weighted averages, and joint PDFs, marginal PDFs, and independence. And then we're going to be able to get into the math stat. So I hope you come back. And uh, yeah, I'll be here.